Thank you. Uh, good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. As a spouse of the Prime Minister of Belize, I bring you warm greetings from the government and people of Belize. And I hope that you're staying safe and in good health during these unprecedented times. I would like to thank Dr. Francisco Becerra Posada and the Scientific Committee of the 2020 Global Health Conference of the Americas for inviting me to give keynote remarks during this important event entitled Global Health Conference of the Americas 2020, No One Left Behind, Moving Forward for the Greater Good. My participation in this event is one that I could not shy away from, as perhaps the most important thing I have learned from my experience as a spouse of the Prime Minister of Belize and the Special Envoy for Women and Children is the power of collaborative action. And of course, I'm an alumni of FIU. I also believe events as such as this one provides the perfect opportunity to underscore the importance of increased awareness and concerted effort for the health, safety, and overall well-being of our vulnerable populations to leave no one behind. Allow me to begin by sharing a bit about my country, Belize, located below Mexico and east of Guatemala. Belize is the only English-speaking country in Central America. We are a young country, having achieved our independence from the United Kingdom on September 21st, 1981. As a small developing state, we face many challenges, and COVID-19 has only increased our vulnerability. It is no secret that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted lives globally, particularly affecting our country's economies and causing a significant struggle to populations worldwide. Unquestionably, since the onset of this global health crisis, much has been done to ensure everyone's safety, but there is still so much more that can be done. The negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need to accelerate and redouble our efforts as a global experience of sharp economic turndown. With measures introduced by governments to flatten the curve of infections, the COVID-19 pandemic is greatly impacting mobility and migration around the world. In Belize, for example, the tough decision was made to close its borders and our government acted quickly by following regional and international advice by declaring a state of emergency for our entire country on April 2nd. This meant that our airports would remain closed. And although there has been a reopening of most businesses, we still have strong social distancing regulations along with mask wearing being legally mandated in public. It is important to note that the international airport reopened to international travel on October 1st, 2020. The consequences of this deadly virus have greatly impacted our tourism industry, which is one of the largest contributors to our economy. The Interdevelopment Bank confirmed that of all tourism dependent economies in the world, Belize is the third worst hit. Additionally, the necessary precautions to shut down non-essential businesses further contributed to economic shocks in the private sector. These factors have impacted the livelihoods of many Belizeans, with well over 80,000 persons without jobs or many facing salary cuts. Our families are feeling the most pressure during this pandemic, especially in their homes due to unemployment, lack of food and essential supplies. 
even in the face of very high debt levels, the government had to borrow to avoid a total collapse of our economy and society. Our government has done its best to assist Belizeans during this crisis, ensuring our healthcare system is in a state of readiness for the COVID-19 pandemic. We are grateful for the support afforded us by multilateral and bilateral partners to increase the social protection measures, which includes food assistance to households across the country, the unemployment relief program that will assist those who lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic, and other vulnerable populations that will benefit from the government's long-standing conditional cash transfer program known as BOOS. The effects of COVID-19 pandemic on Belize's fragile health system have been profound. In the first instance, the government quickly sourced funds to purchase personal protective equipment, testing kits, ventilators, and other supplies and equipment to manage COVID-19 patients. Because of global, global demand, Belize had great difficulties sourcing the most needed supplies and equipment from developed countries, who themselves were ramping up production to manage the pandemic in their own countries. Healthcare providers were forced to change the model of service delivery to prevent the spread of COVID-19 infections to patients in clinics and hospitalized patients. Medical clinics and other services were suspended. Arrangements were made for patients with non-communicable diseases to have their prescriptions filled without face-to-face -face consultations. Telephone consults and online distance consultation were used to interact with citizens to determine which patients are in need of urgent medical assessments. Like many other countries, our statistics show that patients with NCDs are at the higher risk for morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 infections. It is expected that because of the lack of monitoring and regular NCD clinics, more patients with NCD complications will be seen at hospital emergency rooms. It is feared that the gain achieved over the years in addressing NCDs will be lost unless the gap in care are aggressively addressed. Access to cancer care services was already limited prior to the pandemic. Many of the services available in country are impacted in the same fashion as with other NCDs. Radiation therapy is not available in Belize, but this was often delayed or abandoned due to limitations imposed on international travel, border closures, and the financial impact on the country and families. The impact of COVID-19 on the economy decreases our purchasing power, which may translate into shortage of medic medications, supplies, and ultimately poorly controlled NCDs. Shortages of nurses, internists, intensive care physicians, and laboratory personnel present major challenges for us during the pandemic. Funds had to be sourced to employ additional personnel to support the high intensity management of COVID-19, as well as non-COVID patients. Normally, Belize has a proud record of having over 95% immunization coverage. However, with the suspension of some public health services and mobile clinics, immunization coverage has fallen. We have applied for the COVAX facility, a global risk sharing mechanism for pooled procurement and equitable distribution of eventual COVID-19 vaccines to access COVID-19 vaccinations when they become available. The concerns for us and other small countries like ours is whether there will be equitable and timely distribution of vaccines.
we must remember that to end the pandemic and the interests of the health of the world, no country can be left behind. As we face the devastating impact of the virus, we must also realize that the linked outcomes of economic and social stresses and the controls on movements to stop the spread have also had an immense impact on the cases of intra-family violence. It is especially important to address this in the Caribbean, as even before the virus, regionally, regional indicators showed that one in a three women in the region will experience domestic violence. And a third of the region's women reported incidents of intimate or sexual violence. In Belize and many other countries, there has been an increase in domestic violence cases. And as a result of stay at home or orders the vict and victims who are living in fear, many are not reporting their experiences and receiving the intervention that they require. Government agencies, NGOs, com community-based groups and individuals have been working tirelessly to address intra-family violence and to provide prevention and intervention services during this trying time. As the Special Envoy for Women and Children, I have tried to ensure that crucial information on how to report violence is accessible and disseminated easily on our social media platforms. We work along with other organizations like the Women's Commission and the Ministry of Human Development to encourage victims who are currently experiencing domestic abuse to make use of the on-call system set in place where social workers from across the country are scheduled to monitor for needed assistance. Our country's police and women's department have also implemented both a hotline system and a safe shelters for instances where gender-based violence is being reported. These shelters have the necessary precautions set in place to ensure that victims and staff are safe in the midst of this pandemic. Nonetheless, COVID-19 has shown us that there is a heightened need for targeted tools and comprehensive strategies. Public awareness and education are key and needs to be disseminated through health campaigns that highlight the importance of effective prevention strategies. The support of media and social media outreach are key components in awareness raising, providing our populations with essential and accurate information. As we continue the struggle to live and survive the ravages of COVID-19, it is clear that life as we know it has changed and that we must adapt and take action quickly. It will therefore be necessary for countries to take realistic view, a realistic view at how we can get back on track towards achieving the sustainable development goals. We strongly believe that COVID-19 situation has provided a valuable learning lesson and the opportunity to improve health services moving forward. As we listen to the panel today, entitled COVID-19 update. What are we learning? I have highlighted some key points. However, we would like to point out some additional lessons learned that include, one, health system strengthening must be expedited to ensure that new modalities are incorporated into healthcare delivery framework. Virtual consultations introduce elements that in many cases are foreign to both the provider and patient. A rethinking and remodeling of our information systems is necessary to accommodate the emerging models of health care delivery services. Two, definitive sustained action must be taken to embark on a 10-year plan to recruit, 
educate and retain adequate cadre of nurses, doctors, and allied health personnel. And three, support from international partners must be sought to establish an in-country radiation unit to eliminate the need for travel to other countries for radiation services. For all efforts must be made to ensure that marginalized and vulnerable groups have access to essential healthcare services, particularly in relation to NCDs, medication and treatment. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, this event today is crucial to give us the opportunity to work together to find solutions to fight COVID-19. Let us use that same dynamism in bringing more coordinated measures to further protect our populations, to leave no one behind. I thank you.